Section 16 of Other People's Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. Other People's Lives by Rosa Nouchette Carey. Book 6. The Tin Shanty. Chapter 2. An Ugly Heroine. When Jack returned from the Tin Shanty, he found his mother in one of her difficult moods. Her own center of gravity being disturbed, she was looking out on every side for a possible or impossible cataclysm. Humanity is sadly puerile at times. A man with dyspepsia regards his perfectly healthy comrade with feelings that border on offense. Such splendid and lavish well-being seems almost immoral to him. Under some aspects of affliction, it is astonishing that the grass continues green, and yet if nature pulled down her sable curtain every time some son of Adam yielded up his breath, the world would be veiled in utter darkness more terrible than the Egyptians, one of old. But nature is a truer comforter, and never puts off her girdle of hope. Tears flow, hearts break, worn-out bodies lie in their graves, yet flowers bloom, and trees put forth their tender leafage spring after spring, and the blue arc of heaven is as clear and cloudless over our heads, and still the blessed sun shines with equal benediction on the evil and the good. When Jack entered his mother's dressing room with a radiant face, brimful of his afternoon's adventures, Mrs. Compton received him rather coldly. Penelope had been spending the day at Brentwood, and she was tired of her loneliness. As Jack went on with his story, her countenance expressed decided disapprobation. He had done the very thing she had dreaded, and had made friends with the newcomers. But what was the use of her saying anything? Jack was his own master, and she had little or no influence with him. His happiness, his pursuits were always apart from her, and his friends were not congenial to her. She cut him short presently by telling him that the dressing bell had rung, and he marched off in rather a huff, and it was an uncomfortable evening. Jack, who resented his mother's displeased silence, made no special effort to propitiate her, and went off early to smoke his pipe at the lodge. But the next day the horizon cleared unexpectedly. A sad wakeful night had shown the widow her mistake, and with one of her generous impulses she told Jack that she was ready to call with him at the Tim Shanty whenever he liked. "'I will not promise to like your friends,' she finished more severely, "'but at least I will do my duty to my neighbors. But though Jack availed himself of his mother's magnanimity, it may be doubted if he enjoyed his second visit. As he opened the little gate he was dismayed to see Miss Ingram shelling peas in the porch. A huge yellow basin stood beside her, and she wore a coarse bib apron over her serge dress. Her red tam o' shanter was somewhat askew, and Jack, looking through his mother's spectacles, thought she was even plainer than ever. He did not in the least understand why his mother grew so suddenly and aggressively cheerful. Her extreme civility struck him as almost artificial. In reality, she was secretly rejoicing over Miss Ingram's ugliness. That tall, gawky young woman would never attract Jack. Happily unconscious of this unfavorable opinion, Miss Ingram received them with easy cordiality, and taking off her apron, led the way into her parlor. The little room was so low and so full of furniture that Jack felt almost stifled, and he was thankful when Miss Ingram begged him to find her brother, as she was anxious to introduce him to Mrs. Compton. She just ordered Jack off as though he were her lackey observed madame afterwards to the little sister i never saw a girl of her age with such cool assurance she talked to me as though she were my equal in age really the independence of the young generation is one of the sad features of the age but the little sister only smiled in answer when madame was on her high horse she never argued with her when mr ingram made his appearance things were rather better the infant elias chatty brought in the tea-tray but to Jack's chagrin his mother took her leave almost immediately, and he was forced to accompany her. Mr. Ingram, talking garrulously, accompanied them down the hill, but even to his dense masculine perception the visit had not been a success. I wonder what Gwen thinks of that piece of magnificence in a French bonnet, he said to himself cynically as he climbed up the hill. He found his sister shelling peas in the porch again, but there was something disconsolate in her attitude, and as she looked up at him he was surprised to see there were actually tears in her eyes. "'Hullo! What is up, Gwen?' he said, sitting down beside her. 
but though she tried to laugh it off, a big tear fell among the empty pods. Moritz took her by the shoulder and obliged her to face him. Now, young woman, he said sternly, no nonsense, the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Then Gwendolen gave another queer, unsteady little laugh. Oh, Moritz, I did not mean to be silly, and of course I'm not really crying. Oh, of course not, sarcastically, as splash number two occurred. I must be an idealist, too, or I should not be so foolish, she went on. But, Moritz, catching her breath, I cannot help it. It has been like that all my life. When I see a beautiful face, I get quite sick with envy. From a mere toddling child, I have so longed to be beautiful. Oh, don't you laugh. You are a man, and you do not understand. But do you remember dear mother repeating my baby speech? Oh, mamma, when I am an angel, shall I have my beauty face then? when she said why yes gwen certainly how i knelt down and prayed god to let me die that minute gwendolen spoke in a strangely impassioned voice and her small greenish blue eyes shone rather feverishly but her brother only smiled and patted her as though she were an infant good child she always speaks the truth i guessed what had upset you so you admire that stately dame gwen mrs compton oh yes she is beautiful and that dark Spanish style is so uncommon. It was a perfect feast only to look at her. I wonder why her son is so ordinary-looking. He has a nice face, and his eyes are good, but he is not to be compared to his mother. Not in looks, perhaps. Poor Compton, I fancy he is rather to be pitied. He did not seem at his ease this afternoon, and really, Gwen, you took so little notice of him. You were so absorbed with his mother. I'm sorry, returned Gwendolen, in a subdued voice. Moritz, dear, you are very good not to laugh at me. You know they say everyone has a bee in his bonnet, and I suppose I am crazy on this point, but it is so dreadful to be ugly. There, I have said the word for once in my life, hopelessly, irredeemably ugly. Nonsense, Gwen, and Moritz's eyes were suspiciously moist. He adored his sister, and this womanly confession of weakness appealed to him strongly. You are exaggerating things absurdly. You are no beauty, certainly, but no one could love you and not love your face, too. But here Gwendolen, thoroughly ashamed of her outbreak, jumped up and refused to hear any more. I am sane now, she said, in her odd, abrupt way, and I shall take advantage of this lucid interval to pour out your tea. Stay where you are, Moritz, and the infant and I will cater for you. And the next moment he could hear her high, clear tones pealing through the little house. I care for nobody, no, not I, and nobody cares for me. Poor Gwen, mused Moritz, how small and trivial and girlish it all sounded, that longing for a beauty face. But there are elements of tragedy in it, too. But all that evening his tenderness was almost exasperating to Gwen. Meanwhile the mother and son had walked through the village in silence, but at last Jack turned restive. Well, mother, I should like to know your opinion of the Ingrams. I am afraid, with a touch of impatience in his voice, that she is not quite your style. Then Mrs. Compton gave a low, scornful laugh that made him wince. My style? No, indeed. And, again, that tall, gawky young woman came perilously near her lips, but the words were unuttered. Then, as she saw the vexed expression on his face, a kind of motherly look came into her beautiful eyes. Dear old boy, please do not glower so. I wish I could please you by praising your new friends, but I cannot say with truth that I admire either Miss Ingram or her brother. I disliked his joking manner excessively, and then he was so jerky and said such extraordinary things. But I dare say he is clever and good-natured. As for Miss Ingram... But here Mrs. Compton paused as if she were afraid of committing herself. Go on, mother, you need not be afraid of hurting my feelings. And Jack's tone was so sarcastic that Mrs. Compton glanced at him uneasily. Well, dear, it is not the poor girl's fault that she is so plain and of course she has a very nice figure, but such self-assurance is hardly good form in a young woman of her age. And then the way she ordered you about. Oh, no, she is far too free and easy for my taste, too downright and American altogether. But here Jack could bear no more. They were at the lodge by this time, and with a hasty excuse that did not impose on his mother in the least, he turned back to the village and let her go up the drive alone. Jack felt unaccountably sore and angry, for after all the Ingrams were merely new acquaintances. He had only spoken to them three times, the second occasion being a short stroll with him in the fir woods after evening service. 
there is no special reason why he should take up cudgels in their defense. His mother had a right to her own opinions, and there was no need to quarrel with her because she thought Miss Ingram's manners too free and easy. Nevertheless, Jack felt distinctly aggrieved. If there were only one thing on which we could agree, he said to himself bitterly, but it is no use, we shall never think alike on any subject. Things seem worse since I came back. I suppose as people grow older, their prejudices grow stronger. Mother is a splendid hater. When she takes a dislike to a person, she never seems to change her mind. She has set herself dead against the Ingrams, just because they live in the tin shanty, and no amount of argument will convince her that they are gentle people. From that day, Jack never mentioned the tin shanty in his mother's presence if he could help it. Nevertheless, she was perfectly well aware that few days passed without his dropping in for a chat with the artist and his sister. When the Ingrams called to return Mrs. Compton's visit, Jack was over at the farm. His mother gave him a very concise and carefully worded account of the interview. "'The Ingrams have been here, Jack,' she said, very quietly, as he came in looking hot and dusty from tramping the roads. "'Please do not let Ben Bolt jump up on the sofa. His paws are dirty. They were very sorry to miss you. I gave them tea, and they stayed quite a long time, and were very pleasant.' and of course I showed them the view from the terrace. Miss Ingram seemed delighted with everything. I am very glad, returned Jack, but he spoke without enthusiasm. The next minute he changed the subject by giving his mother a message from the vicar. What an escape he had had! How thankful he was that he had taken it into his head to walk over to the farm. He went off to dress for dinner, whistling for very lightness of heart, but Mrs. Compton sighed uncomfortably as the door closed after him. Jack was growing strangely silent and reticent, she thought. Day by day a barrier seemed slowly rising between them. He would not discuss the Ingrams with her. He had never forgiven her criticism. In reality, she was growing puzzled about them. After all, Jack was right, and they were certainly gentle people. There were little tricks of speech in both the brother and sister that showed culture and knowledge of the world. And then, in spite of her shabby dress, for Gwendolen's blue sir showed traces of wear and tear, and her sailor hat had a frayed blue ribbon round it, it was impossible to deny that Mrs. Ingram's figure was beautiful, and her movements peculiarly graceful. She held herself well, and the carriage of her head was really fine. With careful dressing she would look almost distinguished. Mrs. Compton could not deny that. Then a speech of Mr. Ingram's had puzzled her, he had been praising the room in his free and easy way, commenting on its good points, with artistic freedom, and Mrs. Compton had been secretly gratified. Then he had turned to his sister. I don't think the green drawing-room at Brentwood Hall is larger than this one, and it is certainly not so well proportioned. Oh, do you know Brentwood Hall? she had asked eagerly, before Miss Ingram had done more than give an assenting nod. I understood that Lord Royston refused to show it. Even the Brentwood people say is very churlish and inhospitable. Brentwood is not more charitable than the rest of the world, returned Mr. Ingram rather dryly. I believe Lord Royston is a great invalid, and that quiet is absolutely necessary for him. Poor man, had been Mrs. Compton's response to this. It was such a terrible shock to him losing his only son in that sudden way. Yes, and now they say his grandson is hopelessly ill at Eton. But here Miss Ingram reddened and checked herself a little awkwardly as her brother looked at her warningly. My sister and I knew some friends of the Roystons. At least we traveled with them, observed Mr. Ingram easily. One picks up a host of acquaintances in that way, and some years ago we were treated to a private view of the hall. Yes, and we were so struck with the silent pool, went on Gwendolen, following her brother's lead. I don't think they even show the grounds now. There was some fine tapestry in one of the rooms. Altogether it is a very interesting place. And then they had risen simultaneously, but though she had shown them the terrace, there had been no further talk on the subject of Brentwood. I cannot make them out, Mrs. Compton had said to herself as she watched them from the terrace. They have evidently been accustomed to good society, and yet they must be wretchedly poor. That dress of Miss Ingram's was tailor-made and fitted her perfectly, but it was quite worn at the seams. Her brother was far better dressed, really is rather pleasant than otherwise, but Madame, with astute policy, kept all these doubts and surmises to herself. 
Jack went constantly to the tin shanty, and before long his acquaintance with the brother and sister ripened into close intimacy. For the first time the young squire had found friends who were perfectly congenial to him. The bohemian ways, the open-air life, the free and easy manners, which so shocked the dignified mistress of Kingsdean, were all attractions to Jack. "'Life is ever so much jollier to me since you have both come to the tin shanty,' he said quite seriously one evening. But Gwendolen only crinkled up her eyelids and laughed. But Jack meant what he said. It was delightful to drop in for one of those porch teas on his way from the farm. No tea had ever such a flavor for him, and yet Gwendolen poured it out from an ugly brown teapot. By and by he got into the habit of strolling up the valley after dinner. Moritz, who was generally smoky in the porch at that hour, would hail him lustily. How delightful it was to sit in the cool dusk, watching the lights from Kildine twinkling across the valley, while Gwendolen played her mandolin, or sang to them sweet melodious songs, French or Italian or English, as the fancy seized her. Sometimes Moritz would accompany her on the violin, but oftener she sang alone. Her voice was a little high-pitched, but there were wonderful vibrations in it, and at times when the mood was on her, she sang with a passion and power that almost shocked Miss Batesby as she sat in her close little parlor, listening to it. It was too dramatic, too sensational, for the spinster's taste. It made her vaguely uncomfortable, but to Jack it was a revelation and a delight. "'What a glorious voice your sister has,' he had said to Mr. Ingram that first evening. "'It makes me feel quite queer and all overish, don't you know?' But though Moritz laughed at this boyish criticism, he was secretly pleased. "'Gwendolen's voice is not very uncommon,' he returned, emptying his pipe carefully. "'I have met people who rather disliked it than otherwise, but it has been well trained, and she knows her own defects. The odd part is that it is affected by her moods. There are times when she absolutely cannot sing, but now and then, this evening, for example, she seems almost inspired.' She made me feel uncommonly bad once or twice, returned Jack, puffing at his pipe. It was not easy for him to put his meaning into words. Those clear, melodious notes had seemed to play on his very heartstrings. They seemed part of the moonlight, the dark fir woods, the faint star gleams. Life is not all sadness and labor and disappointment, those tones seemed to say. There is love and human brotherhood and true hearts everywhere, and God's truth over all. Be comforted, be strong, be at peace, for there are angels singing in the clear spaces above. Rest, sad heart, and be still. I want you to sing to me again, Jack had said to her a few nights later, but Gwendolen had only looked at him and shaken her head. Not tonight, she said quietly. I cannot get the steam up. And something in her manner made him say no more, and for a long time he did not venture to ask her again. One evening his mother astonished him by suggesting that he should ask the Ingrams to dinner. "'You are always down at the cottage, Jack,' she said a little plaintively, and it must look so strange never to ask them here. We could invite the Wentworths and Clara Merrick to meet them, but Jack curtly and decidedly refused. "'No, mother, thank you. I think it would not do. The Ingrams know you are not in touch with them, and I don't believe they would come if you asked them. They hate dinners and conventionality.' and I know Miss Ingram means to refuse all invitations. Ah, very well, returned Mrs. Compton, dryly. Then I need not trouble myself any further. But though she said no more, Jack's speech had galled her terribly. He meant to keep his friends to himself. She was to be left out in the cold, as usual. She knew how Jack spent his evenings. More than once she and Penelope, taking a stroll in the moonlight, had paused by the inn to listen to that wonderful voice ringing across to them. It is very fine, but somehow I do not admire it, Penelope had said. It is a little too high and shrill. It is too operatic for my taste, remarked Mrs. Compton severely. Miss Ingram seems to me a very odd person. It would not surprise me in the least if we were to find out that she was an actress or a singer. Jack knows absolutely nothing about them, for I have questioned him more than once. They tell me nothing and I ask no questions, has been Jack's reply. But as he said this, it suddenly struck him how strangely little he knew about these friends of his. They scarcely ever alluded to their past life. When we were better off, Gwendolen had once said, and Moritz had spoken jestingly of their palmy days. Have you ever lived in London? Jack once asked. He had been telling them about his mother's flat. 
we have lived in many places moritz had answered carelessly i do not know if the wandering jew ever had a sister london oh yes we have lived there and we once had a hut on exmoor when two artistic souls are on the search for the picturesque and economy they put up with strange resting places do you remember those lodgings at the white cottage in patterdale gwen and how you knocked your head against the ceiling and the old dame's unfeeling remark as to house was not built for giant folk to poke their heads through the whitewash don't moritz i can feel the bump now and gwendolen fingered her coil of brown hair jack had more than once admired her hair in color it was like a ripe chestnut only with a sunny gleam in it and once when they were blackberrying together and a bramble had caught her hat and dislodged some of the hairpins a long braid had untwisted that reached to her knees and the beauty and glory of it had taken jack's breath away he and gwendolen had soon become close friends but the day when he told her of his life trouble, when he first understood what the magnetic sweetness of true womanly sympathy really meant, was an epoch, a crisis to be marked henceforth by a white stone. Things had gone badly with him that day, and as usual he had strolled off to the tin shanty to forget his worries in the society of his friends. Gwendolen, who was reading in the porch, was struck by the heaviness of his aspect, and he sat down beside her, and she saw how tired and pale he looked. Such a wistful, kind expression came into her eyes that Jack felt a little thrill of emotion pass through him. "'I wish you would tell me what has been worrying you, Mr. Compton,' she said so frankly, with such evident understanding that her friend was in trouble, that before many minutes had passed poor Jack had blurted it all out. He loved his mother dearly. She was the dearest and the best mother in the world, but somehow they could not understand each other. It is though we spoke different languages, went on Jack, with a touch of rugged eloquence. Nothing I can do seems to please her. If I had been a clever chap like Felix Earle, she could have been proud of me. But how is she to be content with a slow, stupid sort of fellow who cares for nothing but farming and horses? I shall thank you, Mr. Compton, to speak more civilly of my good friend, a slow, stupid sort of fellow indeed and here Gwendolen's laugh was delicious to hear. Certainly at that moment Gwen had got her beauty face. It was so transfigured with the light of sympathy and warm womanly kindness, and from that day she was never ugly in Jack's eyes. And how wisely and with what old-fashioned sweetness she talked to him, though at first she a little bewildered him too. For her first remark was an extraordinary one. Thou wilt scarce be a man before thy mother, and as Jack's dark eyes opened rather widely at this, she said with a smile, That was only an old quotation, but it is very true. Don't you see how simple it all is, Mr. Compton? One can never be as old as one's mother. We cannot be on the same plane. Youth and age can never have the same aspect. No, of course not, but, Miss Ingram, you know what an awful duffer I am. I wish that you are not so clever, and here Jack's voice had a touch of pathos in it, could you not put things more plainly? My dear Mr. Compton, laughed Gwendolen, don't you know simplicity is the hardest thing in the world? Clever brains are not everything. Please remember that my favorite Owen says, character is higher than intellect, and your mother has every right to be proud of you. And as Jack shook his head rather sadly, she laid her hand gently on his arm, and he could see there were tears in her eyes. Mr. Compton, do try to bear with your mother. She loves you so dearly, even I can see that, and you are her only comfort now God has taken away her husband. Don't you see how sad it is for her? She has lived all the best part of her life, and yours is to come. But for her there are only loneliness and old age, and the house of her long rest. One can only have one mother. And here Gwendolen's lip trembled slightly. Try and make her happier. You will never regret it. And believe me that you will be happier too. Forgive me if I have spoken too plainly, but I remember my own dear mother, and the thought of how little I did for her comfort often presses heavily upon me now. Thank you, observed Jack in a choked voice. No, rather abruptly, it is no use trying to thank you. You have done more for me than even you can guess. And as he said this, there was a glow in Jack's eye that made Gwendolen flush and turn away, as though she were suddenly dazzled. For when a woman first sees the love-light kindle in a man's eyes, and feels her heart beat with quick response, it is as though a new day had dawned for her on the earth, and such a day had 
newly dawned for Gwendolen and Jack. End of section 16「Section seventeen of Other People's Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Other People's Lives by Rosa Noshat Carey. Book six. The Tin Shanty. Chapter three. Jack's Victory. The blackberry season was only just over when the good folks of Sandilands and Brentwood were startled by the news that Lord Royston was dead. His butler had just left him sitting at the breakfast table with an unopened telegram in his hand, and on his return a moment later he was alarmed by the sound of a heavy thud. His master was stretched on the ground, insensible and breathing stertorously, with the telegram still grasped in his stiffening fingers. An apoplectic seizure brought on by the sudden news of his grandson's death was the physician's unanimous verdict. It was just what they had feared, and so on. There was nothing to be done. The faithful old butler and the housekeeper and his ancient valet, who had been his foster brother, watched beside him all that day until the last flicker of life had died away. With the exception of those old retainers, there were no real mourners. Viscount Royston had been a hypochondriac and a recluse since the death of his only son. His personality was a limited one, full of trivialities, a thin, puerile soul whose life pilgrimage had been an incessant fight against visionary obstacles. Lord Royston had only really loved two people in his whole life, his only son, in whom all his hopes were centered, and himself. He had been proud of his grandson, the clever, sharp-witted lad was likely to do him credit, but he had never cared to have the boy much at Brentwood. Boys, even the best of them, were embarrassing companions. He was very fond of Hugh. He wrote long weekly letters to him, and was very liberal in the matter of pocket money. But when the holidays came round, Hugh and his tutor generally found themselves packed up to the old Welsh castle that was part of the Royston property. And yet, when the news had reached the old man that his heir was dead, the shock had been his death blow. And so Hugh Abercrombie Ingram, the ninth Viscount Royston, was gathered to his father's, in the grey old granite tomb where his wife and his son and his daughter-in-law lay and his grandson, you the younger, was buried with him, and the only mourner was the next of kin, a distant relative whom he had ignored all his life, and who, to his own great astonishment, found himself Viscount Royston with thirty thousand a year. Sandylands was so near Brentwood that a special interest always attached to Brentwood Hall. Sandylands was rather proud of its aristocratic neighbor, and until lately Brentwood Hall and the park and the silent pool had been regarded as show-places. We must drive you to Brentwood, Mrs. Compton had always said to her guests. There is some fine old tapestry and a picture gallery, and then the silent pool is one of our sights. And when it was first understood that Lord Royston had laid an interdict on all sightseers, Sandilands had passed a vote of indignation. The old churl, that was what they called him. Jack was full of the news when he went up to the tin shanty, but he thought Gwendolen looked at him a little oddly as he spoke. "'Yes, I know. It is terribly sad. Poor old Lord Royston.' And then she sighed, and went on with her occupation. She was trimming her sailor hat with a broad black ribbon. With a sudden freak, Jack caught up the old frayed blue ribbon and stuffed it into his waistcoat pocket. Gwendolen looked at him in rather a bewildered manner. "'Oh, please do not take that,' she said quickly. It is so frayed and old and dirty. And then she stopped with a sudden flush as Jack looked at her steadily. I shall keep it because you have worn it, he returned. Gwendolen? It was the first time he had called her by her name, and she thrilled from head to foot as she heard it. It is such a lovely morning, more like August than October. Come with me into the fir wood and leave that stupid millinery business. And Jack's voice had such a caressing tone in it and his dark eyes, those beautiful eyes that Gwen had once said reminded her of a spaniel's, were so masterful in their eloquence that Gwendolen put down her work meekly, and so went into the sunshine to meet her fate. Jack never knew with what words he wooed his lady love. When he came to himself, he seemed to be saying over and over again, O oh, Gwendolen, my darling, why will you not answer me? I want one word, only one word. 
but gwendolen only hid her face in her hands and wept passionately and how was he to guess poor fellow that they were only tears of joy they were in a sunny little clearing just above the cottage gwendolen was sitting against a tree trunk and jack half kneeling half crouching beside her was watching her anxiously the red tam o shanter cap lay on her lap and the smooth coils of brown hair looked glossy in the sunlight with a sudden lover-like impulse jack softly kissed them and then half shyly half proudly stroked them darling it is so beautiful he whispered as though an apology for the liberty he had taken but he was a little dismayed when gwen suddenly flung off his hand don't she said as though he were hurting her please don't there is something i must say first that i don't know how to say and then to his surprise and joy she hid her burning face against his shoulder jack let me say it here i heard what you said and i tried to believe it but i cannot i cannot and here a sob mastered her what can you not believe dearest he asked tenderly that i love you why gwen i think i have loved you ever since that day when you first sang to me not really and here he felt her tremble all over but that was more than two months ago no not yet as he threatened to be demonstrative let me say something else first do you know what i once told moritz that i should never marry never have a lover because i was so ugly please please as jack laughed boyishly at this it is no joke it has been a real trouble to me that is why i cried so when you said you loved me gwendolen my darling and then all of a sudden jack's voice grew a little husky you need never trouble yourself about that again i love you and i would not change my sweetheart's face for all the beauty in the world hush you shall not say another word and jack so effectually closed her lips that gwendolen was silenced i have got my beauty face were her first words to moritz that evening when he returned from town and then the feckless creature began to laugh and cry at the same time oh moritz dear old boy i'm so happy jack and i are engaged he is the dearest and the noblest and the most simple fellow in the world and i love him with all my heart he cares for me just as i am ugly freckled gwen and he does not know and then she laughed again and moritz laughed with her but there were tears in his eyes too but while gwendolen was reveling in her brother's sympathy or thinking of her lover with sweet womanly tenderness poor jack was undergoing martyrdom in his mother's dressing-room at his first words his quick manly announcement of his engagement with gwendolen ingram mrs compton had first turned white and rigid and then had gone into a violent fit of hysterics and penelope and trimmer in great alarm had begged him to absent himself for a while you are too abrupt penelope said to him in her wise concise way your mother is highly strung and her feelings are more acute than other people's oh it is only an hysterical attack as jack looked at her anxiously you must give her time to come round when she is better she is sure to ask for you so do not go further than the garden and jack and jack puzzled and miserable in spite of his great happiness wandered up and down the terrace like a lost spirit it was not until late that evening that he saw his mother again she was lying on her couch looking wan and old and there were violet shadows under her eyes that seemed to add to their depth and lustre and as jack knelt beside her she looked at him with a faint sad smile i'm sorry that i misbehaved jack she said with a pitiful attempt at playfulness but you were too sudden and nerves are not made of leather and then her lips trembled and got pale again and the pain in her voice filled him with dull dismay oh jack why are things so frightfully hard for me in this world you are all i have my only one and all your life you have crossed my will and then with a haggard smile she said bitterly i am weary of my life because of this daughter of heth poor woman there was something tragical in her excessive grief another time jack might have waxed impatient but love and love's lessons and the wise counsels of gwendolen were making a man of him so he turned aside her complaints with unusual gentleness dear old mother he said kissing her i should love to make you happy but a man is bound to choose his wife for himself if you only knew what gwen is how clever and wise and true i never knew a girl like her and here words failed jack and he sat smiling to himself in the semi-darkness after the usual fatuous fashion of youthful lovers gwendolen would have laughed with infantine rapture if she had known how transfigured and glorified she was in jack's inward vision 
Mrs. Compton remained silent from sheer disgust and hopelessness. Jack had taken the fatal disease badly. He was in the first hot stage of delirious rapture. Cleverness and truth and wisdom were all excellent things in their way, but when they were to be taken in conjunction with a tall, gawky young woman who crinkled up her eyelids and had freckles, and whose clothes might have come out of the ark for shabbiness, Jack's mother saw no cause for congratulation. The very daughter-in-law whom her soul most abhorred was to be forced on her. No wonder the widow said to herself that night as she wept in the darkness, What good shall my life do me? And yet, strange to say, it was Jack, simple, honest Jack, who remained victorious. It was the strong-witted, self-willed woman of the world who had to submit. Isabel Compton had a proud temper, but she was not utterly self-centered. Her motherhood forbade that. When Jack's young face began to look worn and sad, and his eyes gazed at her wistfully, the nobler and better side of Isabel's nature weakened within her. They were a strangely assorted pair, she thought. Never were mother and son so utterly dissimilar. But if one must be unhappy, it should not be Jack and then the divine spirit of abnegation and self-sacrifice that lies fundamentally at root of every true character came to the surface. Dear Jack, please do not look so unhappy. And then her tender motherly arms went round the young man's neck. Kiss me, Jack, dear, and do not quarrel any more with your poor old mother. Dear, I will try to be good to your Gwendolen. Here she bravely stifled a sigh, but you must both be patient with me. I will go and see her tomorrow. But here Jack's mighty hug almost took away her breath. Never since his childhood had she ever received such a caress. Oh, mother, how good you are to me, he said, almost remorsefully as he released her from his embrace, and at that moment Mrs. Compton was certainly not unhappy. After all, Jack loved her, and the terrible barrier was down between them. It was only as she lay alone in the autumnal darkness that the grim, unlovely reality forced itself on her. Yes, she would keep her promise. She would be good to Jack's wife. But there could be no love between them, and as she tossed on her sleepless pillow, longing for the dawn, she registered a mental vow that the day that saw Gwendolen Ingram, mistress of Kingsdean, she would shake off the dust of Sandylands and return to her flat. Mrs. Compton's miserable night ended in a bad sick headache, and it was not until late in the afternoon when she felt able to pay her promised visit. Jack had spent most of his morning at the tin shanty, but he said nothing about his mother's intention. When Gwendolen questioned him a little nervously, he managed to evade any awkward disclosures. "'My mother was very startled when I told her about our engagement,' he said. "'I am afraid I was rather too abrupt. We must give her time to get used to the idea, Gwen.' And then Gwendolen, who was shrewd enough to read between the lines, very wisely refrained from any further questioning and only gave herself up to the delight of her lover's society. "'You have not repented, Jack?' she asked rather archly, but Jack's answer entirely satisfied her. They passed the morning wandering about the fir woods, and talking happily about the future. Once Jack asked after Moritz, but Gwendolen answered carelessly that he had gone over to Brentwood again. "'Moritz is rather busy just now,' she continued, as she stopped to pick some red and yellow leaves that attracted her. Let me gather them for you, darling, observed Jack, hastily. You see, Gwen, though I want to do nothing but talk to you, I really ought to speak to Ingram. He is your proper guardian, don't you know? But Gwendolen only laughed and crinkled her eyebrows. It does not really matter, Jack, because I am of age. But, of course, you shall talk to Moritz as much as you like. Just now he is up to his ears in business. But he told me to give you his love and congratulations. He said you were to be congratulated, and here Gwen smiled in Jack's face. But, of course, that was only his nonsense. It was no nonsense at all, returned Jack hotly, and then he took her hand and kissed it. Gwen, darling, tell me what stones you would prefer for your engagement ring, diamonds or emeralds, and this weighty question occupied them for some time. Mrs. Compton looked so pale and weary when she started for the tin shanty that Jack felt a twinge of remorse. It had been arranged between them that she should go alone, and that Jack should follow her in a quarter of an hour. Mrs. Compton, who was extremely nervous and depressed, had extorted this concession from him. But though Jack pretended to grumble, he was inwardly relieved. No man ever desires to place himself voluntarily in an awkward situation, 
or to expose himself to a morave mauvais quart d'or and jack was not at all displeased that his mother preferred to go alone but poor mrs compton in spite of her splendid physique the climb up to the tin shanty was a veritable hill of difficulty to her and she was so breathless that she was obliged to stand in the porch a moment chatty who was taking in the milk regarded her with a benevolent grin oh laws yes miss ingram was in and mr ingram too and another gentleman she had just been lighting the fire because the gentleman said it was so cold and as chatty finished this communication she threw open the parlor door if you please miss here's madame come to see you she announced for to chatty the mistress of kingsdean was always madame gwendolen reddened and looked at her brother then she came forward rather nervously it is very good of you to come mrs compton she said with gentle courtesy and then the older woman who had already rehearsed her part kissed her cheek the touch of those cold lips made gwendolen shiver my dear miss ingram it was my duty to come i am jack's mother she said this a little grandly and there was a fine sweep of her drapery that almost enveloped moritz when he came to shake hands with her i am afraid the news has taken you by surprise he observed pleasantly and even at that moment she was amazed at his air of easy assurance young people sometimes make up their minds rather suddenly mrs compton let me introduce mr fraser to you our family lawyer and an old friend fraser this lady is mr compton's mother and then the grey-haired sharp-featured man rubbed his hands together and looked at the stately widow approvingly yes yes i see well as we have finished that bit of business i will just take myself off to the inn and to-morrow morning i will look in on you again what time shall we say lord royston and then the lawyer turned to mrs compton with a courtly bow you will excuse us a moment i am sure for you understand that this sudden and unexpected secession makes lord royston exceedingly busy tomorrow's the funeral but the rest of the lawyer's speech never reached mrs compton's ears lord royston she murmured faintly as she sank on a chair she grew so pale that gwendolen was quite alarmed my brother is the next of kin she said simply as the two gentlemen left the room but we only saw poor old lord royston twice he had quarrelled with our father we never rightly knew why and so he kept moritz at arm's length and of course we never imagined that this would happen poor little hugh we thought he would certainly be lord royston but to-morrow he and his grandfather will be buried together gwen my dear observed moritz briskly he had that moment re-entered the room mrs compton looks tired and overwhelmed suppose you instruct the infant to bring in the tea and as gwendolen departed on hospitable thoughts intent lord royston sat down beside his bewildered guest i don't wonder you are surprised he said in his serio-comic way i tell gwen that i have had to pinch myself at intervals to be sure that i am not dreaming brentwood hall and thirty thousand a year is rather overwhelming after three months of the tin shanty ah here comes jack good old fellow i wonder what he will say when he knows his beggar-maid has a pretty little dowry of twenty thousand pounds fraser says i must give her that you know continued moritz confidentially my father colonel ingram ran through his property and left us next to nothing he was in the guards and unfortunately he was fond of high play my mother she was a miss hazeldean and the present sir rolf is our cousin helped him to pay his debts we were living in belgravia then but we had to economize on the continent for a year or two dear me what changes gwen and i have seen lord royston was giving mrs compton time to recover herself then his manner changed hello jack don't run away gwen will be here directly good luck and best wishes to you my boy and he grasped jack's hand warmly thanks old fellow returned jack gratefully but mrs compton could keep silence no longer oh, jack jack forgive me she sobbed i was so hard on you last night and now coals of fire are being heaped on my head do you know who mr ingram is he is lord royston and brentwood hall belongs to him then jack turned very pale and his mouth was suddenly compressed for the first time he looked his mother's image gwendolen who was just entering with a plate of cakes regarded him with dismay oh dear what has been worrying jack she asked with naive girlishness then jack suddenly marched up to her and seized her hands gwen he said hoarsely will this make any difference why did you not tell me this before i am the last to hear it and i ought to have been the first 
you have engaged yourself to me and by heavens i will not give you up but perhaps your brother will disapprove no he won't old fellow and moritz brought down his hand on jack's shoulder with a mighty clap he is not such a fool he says take her and bless you my children and moritz struck a melodramatic attitude but gwen dearest and here quite unmindful of his mother's presence jack put his audacious arm round his fiancee jack dear i did not want you to know she whispered in his ear it was so sweet to feel that you cared for me just for myself exactly so chimed in lord royston cheerfully gwen and i are both idealists and i had not the heart to spoil her charming little idol i don't want mr compton to be told just yet now gwen those were your very words then gwendolen blushed and looked up at jack with a wistful appeal in her eyes dear it cannot be helped now he said in the slow quiet voice that was natural to him i would much rather have had things as they were and not all this fuss but we must just put up with it was it not splendid of jack to say this before his mother gwen observed afterwards when she and moritz were talking over things oh moray i am as proud and happy as a queen jack does not care a straw about my twenty thousand pounds he says such a lot of money will be an awful bother and that he has plenty of his own and then gwendolen smiled happily what did her lack of beauty matter now she had this true sweetheart of her own could any knight be more leal and devoted darling it is so beautiful how those words rang in her ears as gwendolen brushed out her hair that night she took up a long tress and kissed it almost passionately with what boyish reverence his lips had touched it oh jack my own jack how i love you and that night gwendolen could not sleep for happiness when lord royston had carried off jack for a smoke and a talk gwendolen had been left alone with mrs compton it was an awkward moment for them both but madame's savoir faire saved the situation gwendolen she said softly when jack told me about things yesterday i was very much upset and i said to him then that i would try to be good to you and i meant to keep my word i hope you will do me the justice to believe that dear mrs compton how kind of you to say that and there was a little flush of pleasure on gwendolen's cheek i know how hard it was on you for of course you knew nothing about me and we were so dreadfully poor why continued gwen in her frank way we were very nearly at the end of our tether moritz poor old fellow could not sell his daubs no one would look at them and i was making up my mind to look out for some situation as governess or companion and then she laughed and looked at mrs compton and now you are going to be my daughter and jack's wife mrs compton spoke gravely under the circumstances any demonstration would be in bad taste and i hope that in time we shall be good friends and as she made this little speech she kissed the girl's cheek and this time gwendolen felt no inward chill that walk back under the starlight was a memorable one to mrs compton and as she leant on jack's arm and felt his strong support her widow's heart seemed to sing for joy jack her dear boy jack would never disappoint her more the sister of a viscount with twenty thousand pounds was surely a good enough match for any squire in christendom and yet the foolish fellow was making believe to grumble ingram he begged his pardon royston has been putting down his foot he was an obstinate old beggar he had vowed that there must be no marriage for six or eight months to come he could not part with gwendolen she must settle him at the hall and take her place as mistress until he had got used to things a bit it is an awful nuisance growled jack there will be a grand wedding and no end of a fuss and i know gwen and i will hate it then mrs compton smiled and held her peace she would not mar the harmony of this moment by telling him that she was on lord royston's side madame did not see either gwendolen or her brother again for some days though jack spent half his time at the tin shanty but one evening they came up to kingsdean to dinner when gwendolen entered the kingsdean drawing-room followed by her brother mrs compton started and jack grew very red the distinguished-looking girl in the black silk dress with a pearl necklace that scarcely rivalled her white neck and with the diamond arrow shot through her brown coil of hair could hardly be recognized as the tall gawky young woman in the frayed serge gwen you are always a darling but to-night you look lovely is it because you have got a new frock and jack looked at her with puzzled eyes it was true his ugly duckling was developing into a swan but perhaps after all gwen's beauty face was only for those who loved her 
in most people's eyes young mrs john compton was an exceedingly plain young woman not that one remembers it when she talks or laughs observed old mrs fortescue but she has the pleasantest voice and manner and really she sings like an angel but jack kept his own opinion to himself but his first act when lord royston took up his abode at brentwood hall was to buy the tin shanty and there in their early married days would he and gwen betake themselves for a blissful hour or two on these occasions gwendolen always wore her red tam o shanter and jack always vowed that no other headdress so well became her and uh, section seventeen Section number 18 of Other People's Lives. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Other People's Lives by Rosa Nushet Carey. Book 7. The Aftermath. It was the general opinion in Sandylands that from the hour Miss Patience died, the vicar was an altered man. It was as though some blight had crept over him, some chill despondency that robbed him of strength and energy. His work no longer interested him, and the dust gathered on his beloved books to outward appearance he was only a little more silent and stately and only the friends who loved him and watched him closely guessed that the canker of some secret sorrow was eating out all the sweetness of his life the silence and loneliness of the vicarage oppressed him strangely when twilight came and he sat brooding in the red firelight it would seem to him sometimes as though he felt some gentle shadowy presence beside him as though he were to turn his head he would see patience looking at him with her tender pathetic smile at times the impression was so strong on him that he would rise from his chair abruptly and pace up and down the room to rouse himself dearly as he had loved her he had never realized that he would miss her so intensely or that her sweet personality had been the great comfort of his life her affection had made her center all her strongest affections and interests on the brother who so needed her care and it was only now when he had lost her that evelyn wentforth gauged rightly the depth of that selfish devotion if i had only done more for her he would say to himself and the remembrance of those long silent evenings when she had sat knitting contentedly beside him as he read book after book rose vividly before him why had he been so forgetful and selfish why had he not laid down his book sometimes to talk to her because in her divine patience she had never asserted any claim it is late evelyn and i must bid you good night do not sit up too late my dear that had been her simple formula night after night how small and white her face had looked and what weary lines these were under her eyes my poor poor patience he would sigh and a passionate longing to atone for past neglect would sweep over him some verses the little sister once showed him in a favorite book haunted him perpetually the hands were such dear hands they are so full they turn at our demand so often they reach out with trifles scarcely thought about so many things they do for me for you if their fond wills mistake we may 
well bend not break one september evening the little sister crossing the churchyard on her way from sandy point saw the vicar standing before the marble cross with his eyes fixed on the graven word f feta something in his attitude and expression appealed to her and after a moment's hesitation she crossed the grass border and joined him he greeted her with a quiet smile evidently her presence chimed in harmoniously with his thoughts ah he said you were a good friend to her claire you understood her she owed to you all the comfort of her last months you did more for her than i did all my life i think not returned the little sister quietly you gave dear patience just what she needed an object in life if my brother had married my life would have been more lonely she said that to me one evening not long before she died but i have had him all to myself and so it has been full to the brim i have not to think of myself at all only of him dear mr wentworth it is not like you to be morbid i think mr cornish is right and that it is not good for you to be so much alone it is good for no man returned the vicar but he spoke absently and the cloud that had been raised for a moment settled on him again when the little sister had left him he walked back to the vicarage he remembered that his friend cornish was to arrive by late train that evening but for once even this anticipation failed to move him from his depression he was out of gear bodily and mentally and though he battled bravely against an overwhelming sense of weariness and dejection he was conscious that the enemy was too strong for him that his nerve was failing him and that he must have change or relief or he would break down utterly but it was not only his sister's loss that was pressing on him so heavily that meeting with marion brett more than a year before had reopened his old wound cruelly why had she crossed the threshold of his lonely home that home she had refused to bless why had she stepped out into the sunshine like some strange angel only to embitter his waking hours with feverish longing to see that dear face again marion you have been my blessing and my curse my torment and my delight he would groan within himself and there were times when his burden lay so heavy upon him that he would pray that he might cease to love her but the next moment he would shudder at his own hearsay for he was by nature strong and faithful and believed in the immortality of a noble love she is mine for she gave herself to me and one day i shall have her for my own he would say to himself patience sweet soul was hard on her she could not understand marion's complex nature but when she angered me most i still did her justice with all her faults and mistakes she is a noble woman when douglas cornish saw his friend's face that evening there was a quick sudden gleam of some strong feeling in the keen hawk-like eyes but his greeting was as cool and quiet as though they had met the previous day i hope my telegram did not put you out wentworth he observed but i had a spare day and i thought it would be profitably spent in looking you up but as the professor went up to his old room to get rid of the dust of his journey he thought how tired and haggard evelyn was looking 
this place will kill him in time i must get him up to oxford and find him some work he is eating his heart out in this dreary old vicarage and then he stood still and looked out at the dark firs i must tell him i suppose but i fear he will worry over it and he looks pretty bad now still in his place and here the professor shook himself impatiently as though the decision troubled him but all through dinner he was his old eloquent self and more than once barry smiled to himself as he waited at the sideboard as though the flavor of the old oxford days were sweet to him but though the vicar listened and responded no ringing boyish laugh hailed the racist joke it was one of those still fragrant nights in september a brilliant harvest moon hung like a golden lamp in the dark sky the air was steeped with the sweet resinous perfume of the firs and the mingled scents of late blooming flowers when the vicarage garden had been planted a small portion of the fir woods had been enclosed here on the hottest summer's day there was a cool shady retreat in accordance with patience's wish a rustic bench and table had been placed here and a grassy bank planted thickly with primroses and wild hyacinth stretching to the garden terrace it was a favorite spot with both the brother and sister patience would call it her woodland parlor and there she would sit with her work and book while the wood pigeons cooed to her unheard or the rabbits would flash across the clearing popping in and out of their holes quite fearlessly on fine summer evenings the vicar loved to smoke his pipe there and by mutual consent he and the professor turned their steps towards the wild garden the moon was flooding the terraces with silver light and the gray walls of the vicarage looked grand and medieval in the transforming radiance as they sat down both men had become suddenly silent the vicar weary with his effort to appear like his ordinary self had suddenly relapsed into his old melancholy and the professor puffing slowly at his pipe was saying to himself i suppose i may as well tell him now but before he could get the first words out the vicar turned round suddenly by the way cornish he said rather abruptly i wanted to ask you something have you seen anything of miss brett lately mr cornish started and a dark flush crossed his brow why wentworth he said with a nervous laugh it must have been transmission of thought i was just going to tell you something about her you will be sorry to hear that she has had a rather bad accident was it the moonlight that made the vicar look so pale an accident he repeated and douglas cornish saw the hand next to him clench and unclench itself as though some acute pain had seized him and then under his breath i have heard nothing who is there who would take the trouble to tell me and then with sudden irritation as though his endurance was too tightly strained why do you keep me waiting like this i must know everything everything my dear fellow you shall know all that i can tell you but there is no need for you to be anxious now miss brett is better she has had capital nursing i saw the doctor myself i went down to st margaret's directly i heard about it that was only last week and of course all the fuss and danger was over ah she was in danger then in danger and i never knew 
the vicar's tone was so full of bitterness and suppressed anguish that the professor winced as he heard it my dear wentworth we none of us knew it for the matter of that we are all liable to accidents who of us can predict safely what may happen to him in the next four and twenty hours let me tell you everything as i heard it one of the grey ladies or sisters as i think they call them told me exactly how it happened one moment cornish did you see marion herself no rather reluctantly she was not strong enough for that i think she was lying down she is still weak and pulled down good heavens marion weak and she never had a day's sickness in her life there go on cornish and i will try not to interrupt you but do not keep me on the rack long i will do my best replied the professor rather sadly but i wish you could have heard it from that little grey-eyed sister she was such a kind chirpy little body miss brett was in splendid condition that day she had been working hard in the slums and at tea-time she had seemed in excellent spirits and so full of her work that she could talk of nothing else there was a night school that evening and she went to it as usual and sister miriam the little grey-eyed sister was with her just before the hour for closing came there was a sudden alarm of fire and the engine dashed past of course all the men and boys rushed out and miss brett with her usual impulsiveness followed them and after a moment's hesitation sister miriam locked the door and went too i thought sister marion would get into mischief without me she said and then with a little laugh that was half a sob but i was too late the crowd separated us and i could not get near her it was one of those closely packed tenements in mandeville street that was on fire and strange to say it was the very house where miss brett had spent the greater part of the day when sister miriam caught sight of her she was near the firemen and one of them had handed her two children she seemed directing the men for a bystander heard her say it is on the third floor and the woman is bedridden and there is a paralyzed man too and after a delay and a great deal of anxious watching the helpless creatures were brought out this was all sister miriam could tell me from her own observation the rest was only gleaned from the lookers-on one of the firemen had been dangerously injured and then it was said that the staircase was burning the next moment a poor distracted woman's voice was heard in the crowd screaming out for harry and the baby miss brett heard it and recognized the voice it belonged to a young widow one of her special favorites the poor creature had been out charring and had left children in a neighbor's care no one had seen the children and not a man dared to re-enter the house they had to hold the poor mother by force the smoke will have suffocated them long ago exclaimed one sympathizing irish woman sure nora avick the darlings are safe in paradise with the blessed mary the mother of sorrows but at this moment a tremendous shout and cheering broke out for there black and grimed scarcely recognizable stood sister marion with two children in her arms but as she tottered towards them some one saw her sway and caught her before she fell the boy was crying with terror but otherwise unhurt 
but the baby she held so tightly to her breast was dead something heavy had fallen and struck it for they found a cruel wound on the little head and marion oh my god and marion my dear fellow how she escaped with her life was a miracle but no one can induce her to say much i went through a hell but i knew the children were at the other side that was all she said and i thought of the burning fiery furnace and asked the dear lord to take care of me and you say the poor baby is dead my little goddaughter but i knew nothing i saw nothing only the roar and hiss of the long red serpents everywhere and is she hurt yes of course one side and arm were badly burned and what she suffered for days and nights only her doctors and nurses know but they pulled her through it was the shock to the system you see and then she strained herself carrying those children she had only the use of one arm the other was powerless do you mean it was broken yes very reluctantly it was broken by the same falling beam that killed the baby but it was the burns that caused her the worst suffering she was in the hospital five weeks but now she is back at st margaret's her arm is going on well though it will be months before she will be able to use it with comfort and she strained herself you say yes but she has got over that now she has been very ill wentworth it is no good denying that but she has turned the corner and is mending fast they say that she is very much changed and that her weakness seems to puzzle and distress her she is very low-spirited and frets a great deal about the baby being weak things get hold of her she has an idea that it is her fault somehow there i have told you all i have kept nothing back nothing are you sure are you quite sure of that cornish then as the professor hesitated his face round upon him sternly out with it man we know each other well enough by this time there must be no reservation there is little more to tell returned the other slowly i saw the doctor he was a man of few words but i understood from what he said that at one time they had been extremely anxious yes yes and now well she will not be fit for work for a long time to come the nerves have suffered from the shock and he certainly has his doubts whether she will ever be her strong capable self again at one time they think that she believed herself dying for she called sister miriam to her if i get worse will you send for mr wentworth the vicarage sandylands there is something that i must tell him before i go and though sister miriam promised her faithfully that she would do so she was not certain that she was not wandering is his name evelyn she asked me for all that first terrible night we heard her say that name perpetually then wentworth on my honour i have told you all i know myself and mr cornish rose a little abruptly perhaps because the man beside him had hidden his face in his hands and something like a choked sob reached his ears he has taken it hard the professor murmured to himself as he walked slowly back to the house good god how could she have the heart to play with a man like evelyn wentworth and to spoil his life taken it hard 
all the rest of his life the vicar never remembered that night without a shudder the moonlight faded the gray walls of the vicarage became invisible and still he sat on half stupefied and benumbed by dull aching anguish until his limbs trembled and when he rose to his feet he tottered like an old man the damp wood had chilled him but some thoughtful hand had kindled a fire in the study and had placed some wine and food on the table he took some to strengthen himself then he went to his desk and wrote a few lines rapidly marion i have only to-night heard that terrible story we are friends nothing can alter that and friends should share each other's trouble may i come and see you perhaps i may be able to comfort you a little in your hour of weakness your faithful brother in christ evelyn wentworth and then when he had enclosed the note in an envelope he stole softly out of the vicarage and walked across the dark sleeping village and posted it before the professor left the answer came they were on the terrace together waiting until barry summoned them to breakfast when a letter with the london postmark was placed in the vicar's hand the writing on the envelope was unknown to him but inside there was a slip of paper penciled by marion brent herself dear friend was all it said it was good of you to write i should like to see you but you will find me a sad wreck marion two hours later the vicar had taken leave of the professor and was on his way to the station and it was still early in the afternoon when he walked up tudor street and knocked at the door of st margaret's home the young girl who admitted him ushered him into a little waiting-room and begged him to sit down until sister miriam was at leisure but the ten minutes that elapsed before she made her appearance seemed to him endless when the little grey-eyed woman at last entered he recognized her at once from his friend's description you are sister miriam he said eagerly i hope you have good news for me miss brett and i are very old friends when i heard of that terrible accident i felt i must come and see her at once sister marion is expecting you mr wentworth she returned gently she knows you are here she is better every day she gets more like herself but you must prepare yourself for a shock she is sadly changed do you mean and here a great tinge overspread the vicar's face that her accident has disfigured her no oh no returned sister miriam hastily thank god her dear face has not suffered but she is so weak and can bear so little and at times her depression is sad to witness when you see her you will understand things for yourself but i will not keep you from her any longer and then she led the way talking cheerfully all the time down a long matted passage and opened the door of a pleasant little sitting-room overlooking a green narrow strip of garden there was a couch by the window and there propped up by pillows lay marion brett perhaps the vicar's eyes were a little dim or the light bewildered him but that first moment he saw nothing but gray draperies and a black sling and the shining of auburn hair under the cap border but when she turned and looked at him and their eyes met a great stab of pain went through his heart and unconsciously he fell on his knees beside her oh my poor child was all he said 
but at the sound of that pitying voice a sob came to her wan lips and her hand clasped his wrist almost convulsively evelyn she whispered in a hoarse frightened voice that was scarcely recognized i have been in the valley of the shadow of death but it was you that i wanted when i thought i was dying i felt i could not die without your forgiveness and yet how was i to live in such torture oh what i suffered and then the horrible dread and fear suffered it needed no words to tell him that the white pinched face of the woman he loved so hopelessly the frightened sunken look of the beautiful eyes told their own piteous tale marion brett who had so gloried in her strong personality lay before him broken in heart and nerve and helpless as a little child evelyn she went on almost clinging to him with her feeble grasp for he was speechless with trouble did you hear me i was frightened frightened for the first time in my life i was afraid to die and now and here another sob almost choked her words i am afraid to live what is the use of life when one only makes mistakes i have so prayed to be of use in the world to be a blessing and to bless other lives but what good have i done and now my strength is gone and my work has gone too no no he returned for this roused him to quick urgent speech you shall not say such things to me i know you too well to believe them you have been a heroine if ever woman was one when men refused to enter that fiery hell you went in at the peril of your sweet life and brought the children out and then in his deep reverence he bent over her with worshipping eyes and pressed his lips to the silk sling that held the bandaged arm in the name of him whom i serve i bless you for that deed of love as all true hearts will bless you she lay silent for a moment as though his words had soothed her but the next minute the look of pain and confusion returned again but the baby was dead surely you know that evelyn yes dear i know that but it was no fault of yours how could you have saved her from that falling beam when your poor arm was broken if god's angel had not guided you neither you nor the boy would have escaped alive then he felt her shudder all over it was a miracle she said in a low bewildered voice and a wan smile came to her lips the flames were all around us everywhere hundreds of red serpents twining over our heads and the heat and suffocation were dreadful sometimes even now i start from my sleep with a scream and think i hear that terrible roar yes i know but you must try to forget it marion listen to me a moment these fears this horror this nameless dread that oppresses you are only signs of misery and tortured nerves they are the ransom you are paying for the boy's life it is a martyrdom that you are suffering you poor soul but it will pass no no ah but as god's minister i tell you that it will all your life my poor marion you have loved your own will and have sought to walk in your own paths but providence is giving you this humbling lesson of weakness you see i am not afraid to speak the truth to you no 
you were always true she murmured half to herself and then there came a wonderful brightness to her face i am your friend and friends should be true but marion i have talked enough you are very feeble but to-morrow i will come again and then in tender solemn words he blessed her and went away and that night she enjoyed a few hours of untroubled sleep for the first time since her accident this was the beginning of evelyn wentworth's ministry to the woman he loved two or three days afterwards he found a locum tenens for his parish in an old college friend and put him in possession then he took a lodging for himself near tudor street and day after day he sat in marion brett's little sitting-room reading or talking to her no one does her so much good sister marion would say i think she counts the hours until you come but evelyn wentworth only smiled a little sadly when he heard this but it was no easy task even for his loving and faithful nature to minister to the diseased and weary mind he would leave her in the evening braced and cheered and with almost a smile on her lips but the next day the puzzled look of pain in her eyes would bring back his heartache oh evelyn i have had bad dreams again she would say how am i to live through these nights and sometimes she would break out into piteous weeping and beg him to pray that she might die for existence was too terrible a burden for her to bear it was sadly uphill work but he never lost patience with her gently as one would speak to a bewildered child he would go over the old arguments it is the heavy price you are paying for the boy's life and then he would praise her and tell her that she was noble and a heroine until the old lovely smile came to the poor trembling lips but often his own heart felt ready to break will she ever get over it he asked the doctor once he was a scotchman and rather taciturn he frowned over the vicar's question she is mending every day he returned at last but i begin to fear that she will never be fit for work again she must take life more easily and enjoy herself that is what i tell her saint margaret's will get on very well without her it is not a sisterhood and she is as free as i am yes i know macpherson but then you see her heart is in her work how are we to interest her in anything else my dear mr wentworth that is more your providence than mine but when a woman has been on the brink of brain fever and has had such a shock she is likely to be shelved for a year or two you must get her away from here to some quiet seaside place where she can be amused without fatigue sister miriam is an excellent nurse and will go with her and after a time this plan was carried out and lodgings were taken for her at st leonard's it was not possible for the vicar to neglect his work any longer but every week he spent a few hours with her he knew how welcome his visits were and each time he came he was cheered by the decided improvement in her evelyn she said to him once as they sat together by the window on a late november afternoon i cannot bear to think of all the trouble i am giving you these long journeys every week just to brighten up a poor invalid and to give her a few hours of enjoyment 
you are so good so good no one else would heap coals of fire on such an unworthy creature and i take it all as though it were my right and then she began to weep in the old miserable way marion he said softly and something in his tone seemed to check her tears do not cry so bitterly i want to speak to you am i really good to you my darling then a quick blush came to her thin face you have been goodness itself how could i have lived through this dreadful time without you then give me my reward he returned as he drew her towards him give me the right to watch over you marion i have loved you all my life i think no other woman has ever been more truly loved for your sake i have been a lonely man without wife or child but i cannot face a lonely old age then she shrank from him almost in silence and covered her burning face with her hands as you are strong be merciful do not tempt me evelyn why not my dearest because because i might be weak enough to yield she whispered because i love so dearly to be with you and it would be such rest and comfort but i will not do it never never how could i bring myself to do such a shameful thing in the days of my health and strength i left you and broke your heart and now am i to be a burden to you in my weakness but he checked all further speech marion beloved he said almost solemnly as he looked into the deep beautiful eyes it is no use my will is stronger than yours we will never separate again you and i until death us do part you are mine mine in heart and mind as i am yours and if i loved you in the days of strength i love you far more dearly now in your weakness and sadness and then as he kissed her the chrism of victorious love seemed to flood her very soul with sweetness and so in the fresh springtime marion brett became evelyn wentworth's wife people sometimes said that it was a pity that mrs wentworth was such an invalid and that her husband was obliged to wait on her but douglas cornish who came constantly to the vicarage never shared this opinion he knew that for the first time in his life evelyn's heart was at rest that the woman he had loved so passionately all those weary years had become his dearer and second self they had no thoughts apart in her husband's absence marion drooped and pined you have given me new life she once said to him i owe all my peace and happiness to you how should i ever have struggled through that awful darkness without the help of your dear hand and you are really happy dearest he asked in spite of all your limitations weak health and the pain in that poor arm then as she looked in his face he needed no other answer for he knew that she was truly and utterly content and that his wife was a happy woman end of section 18 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc end of other people's lives by rosa nuchet carey